Hello everyone, my name is Michael Delph and I'm here to talk to you about transmissions. Now, sometimes when you're building a robot, you run into the problem where your motor isn't really fast enough or doesn't have enough torque to be able to lift something. And it, usually people just go out and buy a stronger motor, but there's a much simpler solution to this. It's designing a proper transmission to accomplish the task that you need to be done. Now, uh, transmission works in that you have some sort of input that feeds into some sort of differential that'll either increase the speed or increase the torque. This is a big or because they are inversely related. And then this will affect the output and hopefully if you designed your transmission correctly, this, your output will be able to accomplish the task that you want to design. One way to design a transmission is by using gears. Now, you usually have some sort of motor or actuation device that's connected up to the center, and that produces a torque at that connection point. By using the gear, you then are able to turn that torque into a force that is exerted by the teeth at the end of the gear. When you mesh two gears together, you transmit the force that is being produced at the teeth to the teeth of another gear which then is transmitted to a torque that is operating at the center of the second gear. Another way to design your transmission is by using chains and sprockets. Now, very similar to, to gears, sprockets also have teeth, but their teeth are not designed to mesh with each other. They're designed to mesh with the chain. Now, you have to make sure to choose the right chain for the right sprocket, and we'll talk about that a little bit later. So unlike gears, where the force is transmitted from tooth to tooth, sprockets are designed to interface with a chain. So the teeth of the sprocket actually mesh with the chain, and then the chain transmits the force to other sprockets in the transmission. Another important concept to notice is that the relationship between the input and output directions for chains and sprockets are different. Now, for a gear configuration, in order to get the output direction the same as the input direction, you need to have an odd number of gears as demonstrated by this animation here. That's not the case with sprockets. For sprockets, because the force is transmitted along the chain, it doesn't matter how many sprockets you have in line with the chain, the input direction will always match the output direction. So in order to design a transmission that will actually do what we want it to do, we need to figure out the speed ratio. And a speed ratio is done by figuring out what the product of the teeth of the driver gears are over the product of the teeth of the driven gears are. Now, a driver gear is any gear that transmits a torque to a force, and a driven gear is any gear that transmits a force to a torque. In our example here, we have our, our motor, which is transmitting a torque onto N0. N0 is transforming that torque into a force and producing that onto N1. So because N0 is turning a torque into a force, we know that N0 is driving N1, and N1 is being driven by N0. Continuing that pattern down the rest of the transmission, N2 is driving N3, N4 is driving N5, and at the end, we have N6 driving N7, as well as N7 driving N8. Now, if you look at this mathematically, you can see that we can cancel out N7 because the two parts of the equation that appear at the end is N6 over N7 as multiplied by N7 over N8. Now, what this shows us is that N7 is an idler. An idler is any gear that both transmits a force to a torque as well as a torque to a force. So at this point, we can just cancel out N7 and we will be given the speed ratio. So after you do out the calculations, if you end up with a speed ratio that is greater than one, that means that you have a higher output speed than your input, but you end up with a lower output torque compared to your input. On the other hand, if your speed ratio is less than one, that means you're gonna have a lower output speed, but you're gonna have a higher output torque. So now let's take a look at an example. Let's say we have this motor, and we know that this motor at its maximum efficiency is able to produce 6.15 inch pounds of torque, at 3,800 RPM. Now, if you want to figure out how we got those numbers, please refer to our motor performance video. 
We have this motor, which is hooked up to our transmission. And on the end of that transmission, we have this arm that's five inches long, and it has to be able to lift a total weight of seven pounds. Now, referring to our equations of equilibrium, we know that torque is equal to force times the distance. So taking the force at the end of the arm, which is seven pounds, and multiplying that by the distance of the arm, which is five inches, we know that at the pivot point of the arm, we need to produce 35 inch-pounds of torque. In order to get that, given our motor specs, we need to produce a speed ratio in the transmission of about one to six. Now, any lower than that, we would not be able to produce the amount of torque needed to lift the arm. Because we are dealing with torques in this equation, we need to figure out the torque ratio. Now, the torque ratio is equal to one over the speed ratio, thus signifying that the relationship between speed and torque is inverse. So here we have two viable solutions for our transmission. We have a one-stage transmission and a two-stage transmission. However, for every stage you add, you have to multiply by the transmission efficiency. Therefore, the more stages you have, the less efficient you're going to be. So we take a look at our first example where you have a 12 tooth gear driving a 72 tooth gear and we multiply that by 0.9 which we'll say is our transmission efficiency for the gears that we have to the power of one since it's one stage we're going to end up with a torque ratio of 5.4. If we look at our second case where we have a 12 tooth gear driving a 24 tooth gear which is on the same shaft as another 12 tooth gear which is driving a 36 tooth gear and we take the torque ratio of that multiplied again by our efficiency of 0.9, this time raised to the power of two because there are two stages, we're gonna end up with a torque ratio of 4.86. Now, if we take both of these numbers and multiply it by the given torque that we have by the motor, which is about six, we're gonna discover that neither case is gonna work. We know that before we accounted for the number of stages and the transmission efficiency that both of these possibilities had the same torque ratio. What we discovered is that the two-stage transmission is far less efficient than the one-stage transmission. So even though both of these answers will produce undesirable results, it would be better off to just modify the one-stage transmission and replace the 72-tooth gear with an 80-tooth gear which will give us an exact torque ratio of six to one even after we account for the transmission efficiency. Now, if we take this transmission and apply it to the motor that we have previously, we'll be able to lift the arm. So up until now, we've been primarily talking about something called spur gears. There are two other main kind of gears that you might find yourself using on a robot. First type are called worm gears. Now these are typically helically shaped and they're primarily used because of their non-backdrivable capability. When something is not backdrivable, that means that you can't move the output without moving the input. So for instance, if you wanted your arm to stay at a certain position, even after the robot is turned off, you would use this. However, it comes at a cost. They're usually less efficient, up to about 70%, where spur gears are about 90% efficient, and they are very slow. So there's two things you need to take into consideration when designing your robot. The other kind of gear system, is something called a rack and pinion. Now it's made up of two components, a rack and a pinion. A rack is a gear, which is usually just a bar that has the teeth on it perpendicular to the surface. And the pinion is a small gear that is usually connected to the input that rides on top of the rack and will control the movement. Now, the size of the pinion is important because this controls the rate of change of the movement of the system. So if you're going to be steering, rotating, or lifting something, picking the right size to control the rate of change is important for your design. Now, given your certain application, there are some qualities you might find it easier to use gears rather than chains and sprockets. For instance, gears are much smaller and compact. They're more efficient, up to 95, even 99 percent efficient, and they're quite durable. Since they're all rigid pieces that are interlocking with each other. You don't have any kind of flexion that you would find inside of a chain. Now, some applications where chains and sprockets might be more useful is when you're trying to drive something at a distance. So if you have a motor on the base of your robot and you need to drive an arm that's all the way up top, instead of having a giant gear train going all the way up that height, you just have a motor at the base with a sprocket at the end and a chain connecting another sprocket at the top of the arm. You can also have multiple outputs for the same input. 
So where gears, you would have to have a diverging transmission system. Here, you would just need to add another sprocket and another chain and you'd be all set. And it's quite easily to be modified. Since the size of the sprocket doesn't matter based on the chain, as long as the pitch of the teeth on each sprocket is the same, you can easily change what size sprockets you have where in your transmission system. So it's very important when you're choosing your transmission build that you choose the right size chain and sprockets. Now, on gears and sprockets, there is a vast number of teeth that you can get, but usually it's an even number and it's usually some kind of multiple of six or three. An important thing to know when choosing the right kinds of gears or sprockets is the pitch. Now the pitch is the thickness of each tooth. Now it's not important in a transmission particularly what your pitch is, but what's more important is knowing that all the gears or the sprockets in the system have the same pitch. And this is needed for gears such that they mesh and engage properly. And for chains and sprockets, this is important such that the sprocket is able to interface correctly with the chain. Chains are numbered such that they tell you all the information you need to know about them. So for instance, you might see uh, some very common chains are a 25 chain or a 35 chain. And that tells you all the information you need to know. So the first digit, either the two or the three, is the distance in eighths of an inch of how far one roller is away from another. So for the case of 25 chain, it's two times one eighth, so that's a quarter inch between each roller. Now the second digit indicates whether or not there is a bearing in each of those rollers. If it ends in a zero, that means it does have a bearing. If it ends in a five, it does not. There will be a large variety of chain and sprocket combinations that will work for your given application. The key point in choosing the chain and sprockets is to make sure that they have all of the same pitch. If this is not the case, the system will not work together. I hope this information has been helpful to you. For more information about other kinds of transmission systems such as pneumatics, please refer to the pneumatics video. And to see the driving force behind transmission systems, mainly motors, please refer to that one. Thanks.